All right. So today we are in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to do the second half of Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and in this, I, I want to point out to you a little bit uh, some, of, some overlap that's going to, hap- to come from last week's uh, message as well. Uh, Paul does an, an interesting sort of uh, play here grammatically where he, he repeats himself in a, in a way that's not really a re- repetition of substance, but maybe a repetition of form that I think is really, really interesting. So this week's section that we're going to look at comes in three movements. There is the movement that is your prior state. There is the movement of what God does about that state. And then a movement of what is the result of that state. So very much like last week's message where Marshall showed us that there, we were dead in our sins, but God brings us to life. And the result of that is that we are set apart for the good works that he has set us out to do. In, the, in that same sort of movement, we have... Uh, this idea that not only were we once set apart from God, but we were also set apart from the people of God. So if you would look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, it says this, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by uh, what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through uh, him we have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers or aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. But on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It starts off talking about making sure to tell us that he is talking to the Gentiles. So the the Gentiles are anyone who is not a Jew. Anyone who is outside of that promise of God made to uh, Abraham that he would be the father of a multitude of people, that they would be set apart as God's people and the recipients of the promise that God had for them, which was a physical nation in the physical land of Canaan, that they were going to be set apart in order to show the glory of God on earth. And they would, through Abraham, be a blessing to all nations. Everyone outside of that calling was labeled then a Gentile. And so Paul goes out of his way to make sure that we understand that we're talking to the Gentiles. And this is particularly significant to us. Those of you who are doing the read through the scripture in a year, we are in uh, some, of those, some of those heavy moments, right? <laughs> that's, that's sort of Leviticus numbers kind of section where you're like, do, does it matter that I could measure out the uh, tabernacle? Does it matter uh, that I know who this long list of people is or what the cities that they went to on their way into the, you know, map out the way in? There's so much inside of that that you would look to and you would say, this was probably more important to another group of people that is not me. <laughs> and that's actually true. 
That's actually true, right? Uh, the original audience would have received these writings, and inside of it, they would have seen, in some instances, their own names, the names of their neighbors, the names of their fathers or their grandfathers, and they would be able to make this connection. They would be able to see the promise of God made in Egypt, the deliverance of God through the wilderness and into the promised land, the rebellion of God's people at the point of entry into his promise, the 40 years of punishment that they receive for that, and those who in faith stepped into God's promise and took the land of Canaan. And they would look at these things and they would be able to see names that were familiar to them. And inside of that, they would be able to do two things. They would be able to say, I now understand what it means to be a person of faith. And I see that when God set apart these people, my people were those people. I am in that promise. This is for me. And they would also look at the difficulty of the rebellion and the punishment that they went through, and they would say, those people are my people. And I need to be that person of faith and not that person of rebellion. And the names would be very significant to them. Because it's what connects them. And here, what Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, he's talking to Gentiles. He's talking to those people who were not the people of that promise. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. And he tells them, there was a time. Rem and not only, not, only remem not only there was a time, but remember the time. This is so said in the first century, so near this time where, where Christ has not yet brought all of the Gentiles into that promise uh, that is the promise of, of God's blessing into his kingdom and into his presence, that these people are capable of remembering that division. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those who are called the circumcised, you were identified separately. You were set apart. And in this, he goes on to say, with no hope, no knowledge of God in this world. Now, one of the interesting things that happens when God makes his promise to his people is, is he, he uses a lot of imagery. And if, for those of you that are sort of reading through the, the tabernacle and, and when we later get into the temple, this is going to be particularly interesting for you. Uh, the, when, when the garden was set up, it was set up in such a way that there was mankind living in the presence of God. But mankind sinned, and what does God do at the time when mankind sins but to send people out to the east and to put a guard of cherubim in front of the entrance to the garden so that they could not re-enter into this place of presence with God. And when the tabernacle is built and it's established in an east to west format, and, and when you have only the priests and ultimately the high priest who can come into the Holy Holies, what they are doing is they are traveling from the east to the west. And they cross the curtain, and what is on the curtain? But the cherubim. And they step from the world through the cherubim and back into the presence of the Lord there in the tabernacle. That thought, that imagery, just sort of gives me chills. And after the tabernacle, there will be built the temple, and the temple is set up in the exact same way, except for it is just larger in scale. But there's an interesting thing added to the tabernacle. There is, there is a wall, there is a court of the Gentiles, because there are those who are on the outside of this Jewish promise who see the might and the power of God through the way that he works in his people, and they want to come in and they want to worship, but there is a court of the Gentiles, and the court of the Gentiles is separated from the court of Israel. And so they can only come in so far. So if you imagine this sort of journey that is the movement through the tabernacle, there is a place where the Gentiles would enter into the temple and they would go only so far and there would be a wall and a sign at the gate that said, anyone who is not a Jew and progresses beyond this gate does so at the penalty of his own death. 
This is recorded for us by a historian of the time, uh, Favilus Josephus, who, who was alive in the first century writing these things down. Not a, not a part of the inspiration of Scripture, but just a, a, a historian, a Jewish historian of the time. And he talks about the sign here that reads that, that a person is responsible for their own death if they are not a Jew and they progress outside of or beyond the place of the Gentiles into the place of the Jews. So even a believing Gentile is only allowed inside of this Jewish system only so much access to the worship of God. And almost in a mocking sense, that wall that has been the divider between the Jews and the Gentiles and the worship of God is reported to have only been something like four and a half feet tall. So just tall enough to cause you to say, I understand perfectly, I'm not going to accidentally trip over it into, I'm going to have to make a conscious effort to move beyond where I am into this place that I should not be, but also not so massive that a person could not stand and see those who are actually God's people, set apart by God. And inside of the construction of the temple, there is this constant reminder from those who would be Gentiles that would choose to worship God that I can only go so far and that those people that I can still see are actually the people of God's promise. And Paul calls them to remember this. He says, do you remember this? Do you remember going to the temple? Do you remember that there were different words for you? There were the circumcised and the uncircumcised. There were those who could continue on. There were those who could not continue on. But then we, we always in this one to find, like, what is the thesis? What is that verse that is the verse for this section? In last week's it was, but God being rich in mercy. God, because of his rich mercy, has made a way for those who are dead in their sins and trespasses to be alive in Christ. This week, it is going to be verse 13. But now, this was your case, but it is no longer your case. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall. Now, let's be perfectly clear. He does not go into this and tell us that the dividing wall of hostility that Jesus broke down is particularly that wall that stood between the Gentiles and the Jews. But what an amazing imagery if that is the case. So let's just go with it. (laughs) Figuratively or literally, do you remember when Jesus dies? And there is the beautiful imagery of that curtain that separated the presence of God in the Holy of Holies from even the priests themselves. And that curtain is torn from the top down in order to say, you who are believers, you who are in Christ, who are following God, have access to God yourself through the person of the Holy Spirit. And you no longer need to be set apart. You have access to God. And that is an amazing image that we we push on and we lean on all the time because it shows us that we have access to our God. At the same time that that curtain was torn, The dividing wall, in this case, not literally, but figuratively, is brought to the ground. And whereas last week we see the separation between us and God as being demolished inside of the person of Jesus Christ, this week we see that that division of God's people and those who were labeled intentionally as second-class citizens is gone. And there are only believers. This doesn't, this doesn't hit us as, as powerfully maybe as it would have in a first century. Because, because in our minds and, and for thousands of years of history, the way that it has worked for us is there have always been the Christians and the Jews. And we are separate in our faith. And we would look to them and we would say, how can you not see inside of your own scriptures, inside of the prophets? How can you read Isaiah and the suffering servant and not see Jesus 
and we mourn for and we pray for the faithlessness of Israel that they would see that this Messiah that they've waited for has come. He has most definitely come to deliver them and should not be rejected. We have this division that's very sort of natural for us. And it's hard for us to understand. I think in part the way that the Scripture is used, because there are times in the Scripture where, uh, the, especially in the Gospels, where the word the Jews is used to signify a specific group of Jewish leaders who were trying to silence the ministry of Jesus. And so when we read the Jews, we just assume the Jews in total. And even when we hear about the masses and we, we hear the masses at uh, the trial of Jesus shouting out, crucify him, and it says, and the Jews were crying out, we, uh, we sort of take into that all of the Jews were crying, crucify him. But that's not the case. What is, what is happening here is that there are just particular sects of Jews, and there are Jewish leaders who are doing these things, and, and that the word Jew is used there in, in sort of a, a more universal way doesn't really show us what is going on, because all of the apostles were Jews. Jesus and his family were Jews. All those who wept and walked alongside him uh, on the road to Golgotha, where he would be hung uh, on the cross, were Jews. In fact, the book of Acts has 28 chapters, and it is not until Acts 11 that we have the first Gentiles come to Christ. Almost halfway through. And when the Gentiles first come to Christ, Peter stands up in front of the whole group and says, Hey, I don't know, it's a surprise to me too, but I promise the same thing that has happened for us has happened for them. And they have received the Holy Spirit and they are believers. And, and don't, don't shout at me, this is really a thing. And so where we in our minds have this sort of expectation that, they, of course, you know, the Christian church is, is a Gentile church and the Jews were those who had their chance, but they blew it. That is not at all the case. It's particularly not the case here in the first century. And so Paul is writing to these people, these people that are a part of that, can you believe it? Can you believe that God has manifested himself even to the Gentiles? And Paul is writing to them and encouraging them saying, yes, yes, this is the case. You were on the outside, but you are no longer on the outside. He does this in Galatians when he says, there is now neither Jew nor Greek. Free nor slave, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. And this is the way that in Christ, because the, the one thing that has run through the entirety of Ephesians for us at this point is the, the phrase in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Him, in Christ. These things have carried throughout it. So in Christ, he has now taken two people and he has made them one body in which he is the head and he is building in them a wall. The foundation of that wall, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone and every person added to that wall are the believers who would hear the message of the gospel, who would hear that I was separated from God because of my sin, and there was nothing that I could do about it, but Christ paid the price for my sin. He took my sin and gave me His righteousness. He took my punishment and gave me His reward. And all who believe in this gospel are added to this wall that is founded on the apostles and the prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone so that we would collectively, not individually, but collectively be the place wherein God himself chooses to dwell. That includes you. One of the most tragic things that I see when we read through Scripture, when we go back to Genesis chapter 12 and we read about God calling Abraham out from the people and saying, I have chosen you to set you apart and from you I will make a great nation. And all of the nations of the world will be blessed. Blessed. 
And then you get to the first century and you read the conversations that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And all they want to talk about is we are children of Abraham. We are the blessed. We are the set apart. And it seems to me that they have forgotten. They've forgotten that this is them being set apart for the purpose of showing the glory of God to all the world so that all would be brought in. And they became so introspective and it became so about them. They were zealous for the law. They were zealous for that opportunity to show God, see what it is that I'm doing for you. This isn't just in the first century. This happens all throughout, right? In, in Isaiah chapter 1, we have God calling out to the people of Israel and he's saying, you're gathering for all of these festivals. Who asked this of you? The, the correct answer to that is, you did. Because everything that he is accusing them of, he has told them to do in Leviticus. But he says, who asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Can you imagine? Can you imagine God looking at us entering into the church building and entering us in, or entering into worship to do the things that he has called us to do? And instead of receiving that as an offering of worship, he would look to us and he would say, who asked you to be here? You're just dirtying up the carpet. Trampling my courts. He goes on to talk about the incense that he has called them to light and to use and given them theological reasons of why this is an act of worship. And he says, the incense that you burn is not a sweet smell to me. It's detestable. And he says, I don't need the blood of animals. Why are you slaughtering these animals? And he says, although you would pray many words... I will not hear them. And you've got to imagine the confusion of a people who have been called to do all of these things. And now that they are doing them, it's not that they've neglected them, they are in the process of doing them. And inside of that, God says, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? None of this makes sense to me. And the reason that he gives is this. You come here and you do these things, but you have no care for what's going on outside of these walls. And in the NIV, the NIV says this so perfectly. The, the charge that he gives them, the imperative that comes after he has made this ac accusation is this. Stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right. Easy enough. Broad, but easy enough to understand. Stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right. Plead the case of the widow and the orphan. Israel forgets this. And, at the, and throughout their history, and especially in the time of the first century, we find a people who are celebrating the fact that they have been set apart. They're celebrating the fact that God has called them out and saved them, and they have forgotten that the purpose of their salvation was that the nations would be blessed. That they were set apart so that they could be sent on mission. And it is the same for us. Yes, we have been brought into the people of God. And so when we look back and we read the Old Testament stories, those are our stories. Those are our spiritual fathers. And we see inside of them the victory that God has given them when they are in His will. And we also see the tragedy that befalls them when they step outside of His will and do things in their own power and their own strength and when they neglect the world outside of them and become too introspective. Those are our stories now because of the blood of Jesus Christ that has broken down that barrier. In that, let us not be guilty of making those exact same mistakes that Israel made. The mission statement of this church is the gospel of Jesus Christ in us and through us. And it is easy for us to come in and look at a passage like this and get all excited about the in us, isn't it? In the last two weeks we've talked about the work that God has done in us. That he has brought us to life spiritually and so that we are no longer separated from God himself. And not only has he not separated himself from us, he has not made us as the Gentiles second-class citizens, but he has made us equal inheritance uh, and inheritors of his promise. 
Why? So that we can be a dwelling place for God and so that we can be about those good works that he had set for us to do before the foundations of the world so that all of the nations would know his name and his glory because of us. There's a famous magician from Las Vegas who is a very active uh, atheist. Spends a lot of time debating why Christianity isn't a thing, and, and he tells this story, uh, and, and in this story, he, he talks about how he had finished a show, and this person came up to him and just said, I'm praying for you that you would come to know Jesus, and he said, you know, his first thought was, okay, here's another one, and this is kind of what I do, and I'm going to just sort of tear them apart, and then he pauses, and he thinks, what a loving thing, And then he goes, he goes on to say in this interview, he says, there is, there is nothing more grotesque or unloving, nothing more violent or shameful than a Christian who doesn't share their faith with the, those they believe to be lost. So if you believe in hell, if you believe in the conscious eternal punishment that is the separation from God entirely, where we are left with nothing but the full weight of our sin as punishment for all of eternity. And you know that there's a way out. And you choose not to share it with me? What level of hatred and he said in that moment, he decided that it wasn't Christians that he disliked. It was Christians that didn't have the courage to share their faith that he thought was bizarre and unlovable. And church, I want to remind you two things. I think there's an opportunity inside of this passage for us to be called to joy. I think there's also an opportunity for us to be called to task. The call to joy is this. When Christ died, he died for us. And he has set us with his chosen people, co-heirs with Jesus himself. And this place that he is building where he can be seen and worshipped by all of his creation includes us. But as we take on the stories of our spiritual forefathers, those Old Testament stories where there is victory and tragedy, we have to be careful to learn from those stories and to not allow those same tragedies to befall us and not to allow ourselves to become so introspective that we forget that the reason we have been saved is not because we are super cool and God just wants to spend all of eternity with us because how could he not? But instead that we would be made alive in Christ so that others would hear the truth of his gospel and he would be glorified as his creation from the extents of the earth would be drawn together in the worship of our God as one people, one body, one building, and Christ that cornerstone. Be aware of the work of the gospel that is at work within us to sanctify us, to make us more like him so that we can practice the gospel, or the gospel can be practiced through us. And our friends and our family and our neighbors and the ends of the earth would hear the truth of Christ, that he has come, that they might be set free. And those whom he sets free will be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come at this time. But before we begin singing, I want to, I want to pray.
Father God, I thank you that you did not wait until we were lovable to love us. You did not wait until we were acceptable to receive us. But God, you made us what we needed to be in order to draw us into your presence. And that that work continues within us to grow us. God, that as we live this life inside of the truth of your gospel, we have our ups and we have our downs, and you are there all along with us. God, I thank you that you have chosen to commission us. That the glory of your name and your saving grace would be made known through your church and to the world. God, grant us repentance for when we have failed to do this. When we have been more concerned or only concerned with our own sanctification and not the salvation of the world. God, grant us repentance. Give us the courage and the strength that we need to go out and do what it is you have called us to do. God, I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.